On December 2nd, 2019, DC Fontana, a legend of Star Trek, died in Los Angeles, California. And to honor her and her contributions to the franchise we all love so much, I thought I'd make this video and take a look at this amazing woman's life. Born in Sussex, New Jersey on March 25, 1939, Dorothy Catherine Fontana, who would later become known as DC Fontana to the Trek community at large, would show a unique talent for writing at a very early age. At the ripe old age of 11, DC herself decided she wanted to be a writer. She had thrilled her friends and family with various horror stories she had written about them. And after attending Fairleigh Dickinson University, where she graduated with an associate's degree as an executive secretarial major, she would land a job working at Screen Gems as the junior secretary to the president of that studio. Unfortunately, the job would end up being short-lived, and after the death of Screen Gems president, DC would move to Los Angeles, California, where she got a job in what was known as a typing pool at Review Studios. A typing pool is a group of secretaries working at a company available to assist any executive within that company without being permanently assigned to said executive. This meant that DC got to know a lot of people around the lot, such as Samuel A. Peoples, who would end up writing Star Trek the original series' second pilot, Where No Man Has Gone Before. Working as a secretary to Peoples during his time on the Western television series Overland Trail, Peoples would pack up his covered wagon and head on to a new series called The Tall Man, another Western that he brought DC Fontana to with him. While working with him, Fontana wrote a story called A Bounty for Billy, which she would actually sell to the series. This was her first story sold, and she was only 21 years of age. She would continue to work with Peoples, selling six separate story ideas for various series. But when Peoples moved on from the studio, Fontana stayed and re-entered the typing pool, though this job would not please her for long. Watching for any potential new job openings for various television shows, eventually Fontana would apply for a job on the Marine Corps-based series called The Lieutenant. As a result, Fontana began working as a secretary for that show's producer, Del Reisman. It was also around this time that she adopted the gender-blind first name of DC. DC Fontana in itself is a partly a pseudonym because I wasn't revealing that I was a woman. Um, that the first six episodes of anything that I ever wrote, which all happened to be westerns, action adventure, were written under my full name, Dorothy C. Fontana. Uh, but then I ran into the thing of, well, women, women don't write action adventure. Yes, they do. I just wrote six of them. What's your problem? Uh, but I wasn't able to uh, submit material under my full name, so I s started hiding out behind my initials. And so that became a bit of a pseudonym. Um, and as long as the story was good, people were buying it. So, you know, I didn't have a problem with that either. Um, but using um, Michael Richards, which was the pseudonym at the time, which my two brothers' names, Michael and Richard, um, it was uh, an indication of uh, a script I didn't particularly care for what had been done to it, so I took my name off it. The Lieutenant was a show created by a generally unknown man named Gene Roddenberry. And Fontana would end up working directly for Gene when Jean's own secretary took ill. Discovering that Fontana wanted to be a writer, Jean encouraged Fontana to write and release her first novel. And in 1964, she did just that. It was a western called Brazos River, and was co-written by Harold Sanford. Roddenberry's The Lieutenant series lasted only one season. But when he began working on a little idea he had cooking up named Star Trek, he kept Fontana on as his secretary, and she was introduced for the first time to the genre of science fiction. Robert H. Justman, associate producer for Star Trek, who loved Fontana's work, would convince Roddenberry to give her the task of writing a teleplay on an idea he had for an episode called The Day Charlie Became God. She worked the premise into a script for Charlie X. Although she gave Roddenberry the story credit and only took the teleplay credit for herself, most of the story idea was actually hers and hers alone. 
she would then write the story for the episode Tomorrow is Yesterday. And by the middle of the first season, Fontana would be promoted to the position of Star Trek's story editor. After wowing both Roddenberry and the network with her rewriting of the script for the episode This Side of Paradise. That was September of 1966. Mostly I liked uh, working with Jean Kuhn, which was a very nice communal kind of relationship we had because we both had the same sort of sense of humor. She would go on to come up with ideas for episodes such as Journey to Babel and Friday's Child, although her main job was to rewrite the work of others when those scripts simply didn't work out for the show. We really needed to work out Adonais. He was something of an empty character, and we needed to give him more character, more interaction with our regular leads. And also, there were some production problems that had to be handled. I remember a problem we had on um, By Any Other Name, and Gene Kuhn and I both kicked around, how the heck do we have essentially six to eight aliens take over a starship of 400? What can we do? And we tried everything. We could not come up with an answer. So the two of us went into Gene Roddenberry and explained the problem. And he had on his desk this rather uh, odd little paperweight that I had given him. I'd brought it back from Mexico on a trip that I had taken. And it had this uh, uh, dodecahedron shape. And he started sort of nudging it around his desk with his finger. And he said, well, suppose the aliens had this machine that turned our crew into shapes like this. And it was the essence of who they were, but it kind of got them out of the way. And we said, great, problem solved, and went out you know, singing and laughing, and, and uh, the problem was solved. That's all we had to do. And we could also dispense with the rest of the cast for you know, great parts of that particular episode. In 1968, before production on season three of Star Trek began, Fontana would leave her position on Star Trek to become a freelance writer. But this didn't stop her involvement with Star Trek, as she would sell her scripts for the episodes The Enterprise Incident, That Which Survives, and The Way to Eden for the show, with those last two scripts under her pseudonym of Michael Richards. Going out on her own meant Fontana could also write for other shows, and in 1969 she would win a Writers Guild of America award for an episode of Then Came Bronson, titled 2% of Nothing. After Star Trek's cancellation, she would again team up with Gene Roddenberry, this time as his assistant on The Quester Tapes, but did not do any writing for this show. She did, however, write the novelization version of it, and would later write a script for Roddenberry's new project called Genesis 2. By 1973, when Star Trek the Animated Series production had begun, Fontana had been hired on as both story editor and associate producer for the show. One of her tasks on the show was to receive pitches for episode ideas, which she would then, in turn, relay to Gene Roddenberry. After Star Trek The Animated Series ended, she would continue writing for various shows, including The Six Million Dollar Man and Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. But when work commenced on a new Star Trek series called Star Trek The Next Generation, Fontana would once again be called into the Star Trek universe as a part of the TNG team, and would work an idea she had into the pilot episode titled Encounter at Farpoint. Roddenberry offered Fontana the position of story editor on TNG, but she refused that position, instead wanting the associate producer role, and eventually she got it. Unfortunately, it was during this time that Fontana and Roddenberry had a falling out. Fontana had written a story that would have brought Leonard Nimoy back to Star Trek on the small screen and onto the Next Generation stage as Spock, but Roddenberry outright rejected her idea with no real explanation. Roddenberry also expanded her work on Encounter at Farpoint to add the character of Q, without approaching her to add him to her story. As a result, when it came to the episode The Naked Now, she had her work recredited to her pseudonym J. Michael Bingham. Her relationship with Roddenberry became so strained that just before her departure from the TNG family, she had begun to tape record her and Jean's conversations. After she left, she put in a claim with the Writers Guild of America, that she had also worked as story editor on the series, but was never paid for it. This claim was settled amicably 
with Paramount Television, but her relationship with Jean never recovered. Fontana would go on to write the Star Trek novel Vulcan's Glory, which would be about Spock's first mission on the Enterprise under the command of Captain Christopher Pike. Fontana returned to Star Trek, this time Deep Space Nine, writing the episode Dax, which she found very difficult to do since the character hadn't really been fleshed out yet. Fontana would also write a few episodes of Babylon 5, and would actually create the storyline for the interplay video game Star Trek The Secret of Vulcan Fury. Together with Derek Chester, she also wrote the scripts for Bethesda's Star Trek video games Star Trek Legacy and Star Trek Tactical Assault. And as if that wasn't enough, Fontana would actually write the episode to serve all my days for the fan film production Star Trek New Voyages. And she would write a sequel to her episode The Enterprise Incident, entitled The Enterprise Experiment, for IDW Publishing for their comic book series Star Trek Year 4. Dorothy D.C. Fontana was an amazing woman, and without her, we'd never have many of the elements and stories that made Star Trek great. The Vulcans were, at the time, as mysterious as the Romulans. We didn't know that much about them because they hadn't been that developed. So as we went along, we made discoveries about the Vulcans. In fact, I just got a letter from someone in France who practically wants me to write a thesis on the Vulcans. And, it's, you know, we were just making this up at the time. <laughs> at the end of the first season, in between breaks, when we were preparing for the second season, I went to, around to all the actors and said, tell me about your character. You've lived in this skin for a year now. Tell me more, what you know about this character. And then I put it into the Bible as an expanded edition of the format so that other writers would know what has come out of it. Her contributions to our beloved franchise cannot be overstated. It saddens me deeply that she has passed on now, that her voice and her great stories she could tell about Star Trek will never be heard directly ever again. However, her voice isn't completely gone, as when we watch Star Trek, she will always be there. Her imagination and creativity beckoning us to spend some time with her through the episodes she wrote, so we can journey along with this fantastic woman exploring strange new worlds she created and new civilizations she developed, boldly going where no woman had gone before. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little trip into the life of Dorothy DC Fontana. And I'd love to hear any stories that you might have about this amazing woman. So leave those comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Normally I end these videos with my Patreon advert and uh, live long and prosper, but not today. Instead, I just want to say thank you DC Fontana for helping make Star Trek great and inspiring people such as myself to strive for the dreams that they have and not let anything stop them. You will be missed.